When it comes down to potentially extending lifespan, the world of longevity, there's a lot of confounding things, right? A lot of different things that contradict each other and a lot of things that really don't add up. But one of the things that we've seen time and time again is that a little bit of stress is good. A lot of stress is not so good. But being able to put an actual number on that and understand what we really need is difficult. And there's this relatively new concept that we're gonna break down in this video. It's known as mitohormesis. And what that is is essentially blending two words, mitochondria and hormesis. Now, hormesis is just the stressor, right? The hormetic stress. How a little bit of stress makes us stronger, but a lot of stress would make us weaker. And then mitochondria is essentially, you know, the powerhouse of the cell. But there's a lot more than just that. We're now understanding how to stress the mitochondria specifically so that the mitochondria gets stronger. Because we've seen in a recent paper that came out in 2023 that all aging roads seem to lead back to the mitochondria. So all aspects of aging and longevity seem to come back to the mitochondria at one particular point. So we're gonna break it all down and understand how to get the most out of this mitohormesis to get the best potential longevity effect. And if you like chocolate, after today's video, there is a link for Element Electrolytes Chocolate Medley. So three different chocolate salt flavors that only have a couple of calories. So 1,000 milligrams sodium, 200 milligrams potassium, and 60 milligrams magnesium. So full spectrum electrolyte, but three different flavors. Chocolate salt, chocolate mint, and now caramel chocolate. So that is a pack of three different kinds of chocolate salt for you to try. This is a limited thing and it's just coming out for right now. So I want you to check them out. And if you do try it, you also get a free variety pack. So when you use that link, drinklmnt.com slash Thomas to try those chocolate electrolytes, you also get a free variety pack. So that way you get a bunch of different flavors that you can give away to a friend or whatever. The cool thing about these chocolate flavors, you can mix them with hot water. So you get your electrolytes in, couple of calories, and it feels like you're sipping on hot chocolate. The chocolate mint one is a unique taste. I didn't think I'd like it at first, but it really does taste like just almost like an Andes mint, like except you're sipping on it and it's hot and it's kind of cozy. It's perfect for winter time. Anyway, check them out. It's gonna revolutionize the way you do electrolytes. That link is down below. Now, before anyone wonders if I'm filming this in a hospital because I have an IV in my arm, I'm just doing a hydration IV for the heck of it. And I needed to kill two birds with one stone and film at the same time. So here we are. Now, in the world of mitohormesis, we learned in 2006 in the research that oxidative stress was actually good for the mitochondria to a certain degree. And we learned that, oh, well, when there's reactive oxygen species or oxidative stress, it makes the mitochondria stronger unless it goes too far. Then in 2007, we actually realized that when there was a fair bit of oxidative stress on the mitochondria, it actually promoted longevity. They found that because they would deprive cells from, of glucose. And when the cells didn't have glucose, they would go, uh, they would stress out because that was their fuel, right? But they found that it would create just enough stress to where it actually made the cells stronger. And that's kind of where we're at with a lot of the research now, but now it's unfolding where we're learning the specifics of it. We have to understand what's called the reverse J curve. And exercise is a perfect way to look at this. If you take people that do not exercise at all, they're gonna have a pretty low life expectancy. If you take people that exercise a lot, they're gonna have a better life expectancy. But if you take people that exercise an extreme amount, that reverse J curve demonstrates that they're going to actually live not as long as the people that exercise a lot or a moderate amount, but they will slightly live longer than people that don't exercise at all. The point is, is that once again, the dose makes the poison. But what I'm getting at with this is when we look at the world of longevity, is that our cells do not have the ability to have conscious thought, right? Our cells can't consciously be aware of what is going on and how they need to course correct. They rely on signals, okay? So they rely on stress signals. For example, oxidative stress. We're under stress, so we have oxidative stress that builds up, and that is a signal to the cell to adapt. But it turns out that we have mitochondrial signals as well now. 
And that's what we're learning. So some of the mitohormetic signals that would actually condition the mitochondria to get stronger, just to name a few things, caloric restriction, uh, exercise, fasting, some toxins, these are all things that would tell the mitochondria that there's stress and it would allow adaptation. But most of us know that at a fundamental level. But now we're seeing that just those basic things that we kind of understood that were good for longevity aren't the only things. For example, when we exercise, we have an increase in calcium ions. Now this is required for the muscle to contract, but this increase in calcium ions actually acts as a stressor for the mitochondria too. So there's all these different things. Now, a lot of the roads come back to exercise being the most important thing, but let's talk about something very specific. There's something called a mitokine. A mitokine is something that is secreted by the mitochondria when the mitochondria is under stress. Now, you've possibly heard of exerkines before or myokines. Myokines are secreted by the muscle, and it's one of the reasons in longevity science why they say having more muscle mass and exercising is so important, because your muscles secrete these myokines that marinate all your cells in this elixir of youth, if you want to call it that, and that's very beneficial. But the mitokines, not to be confused with myokines, are specific to the mitochondria. And when the mitochondria is under stress, like from fasting or from exercise, they secrete these mitokines and they act like little beacons, beacons of light that go out for extracellular communication to tell other cells and other components of the body, hey, do what you can to help that mitochondria adapt, but also triggers a cascade of beneficial things that happen throughout the body as sort of a rite of passage because you were doing something that inflicted mitochondrial stress in a good way. One of the most common mitokines is one called FGF21. I did an entire video on FGF21 over a year ago. FGF21 is unique, and I know this is complicated because it is a mitokine and a myokine. And its sole condition is to help the cell adapt to insufficient energy. So it helps the cell get used to being in a caloric deficit and it helps the cell become more efficient so that it can do more with less. It is one of the most phenomenal things that we've really uncovered in the world of aging and mitochondrial research in the last few years. But then there's one that's called GDF15. And this is the one that I hope you're paying attention to because this is fascinating stuff. GDF15 increases when we exercise, okay? Now GDF15 has all kinds of beneficial things. In fact, studies have demonstrated, and there was a study in aging cell, that when GDF15 was low, it actually caused damage. It caused mitochondrial damage, and it also caused the skin to weaken and form wrinkles. So this mitokine that's secreted from exercise literally makes us look younger. Here's what's really interesting. It's going to blow your mind. You know what else increases GDF15? Smoking and inflammation. So does that mean that a little bit of smoking is good? No, it doesn't mean that. But it does, again, bring us right back to that reverse J curve. With things associated with longevity and stress, the dose makes the poison. Do you think that going out for a run is going to release as much GDF-15 as smoking a pack of cigarettes? No. Too much of this GDF-15 also signals as a beacon of I need help from the mitochondria. A little bit of this GDF-15 says, hey, mitochondria is getting stressed, do things to help it. A lot of it says, hey, that mitochondria is under some serious stress, we need to shut down other processes, and all this other stuff goes cattywampus. So it's again, the dose makes the poison. The bottom line here is that excessive mitokines are problematic too. And there's one particular mitokine that is heavily linked to longevity. And once I get through this part, I'll be able to kind of put this in a bacon wrapped sense that I'll teach you kind of how much to exercise and how much you want to stress your mitochondria. There is a particular peptide that is called humanin. And humanin is also a mitokine. And it's, again, secreted mainly via exercise. Its main role is to increase mitochondrial efficiency so that the mitochondria can get good at using fuel so it can be more efficient for exercise. 
when it is present, it also decreases reactive oxygen species. So it makes the mitochondria operate in a cleaner fashion. Because again, it's all about efficiency. If the mitochondria is gonna be running hot, we don't want it creating a lot of exhaust. And it also increases GLUT4, which allows glucose to get into the mitochondria faster. Low humanin is associated with increased metabolic dysfunction and mitochondrial dysfunction, but it's also associated with metabolic illness and associated with Alzheimer's disease and neurodegenerative conditions and accumulation of beta amyloid plaque. Then there was a study published in Aging that demonstrated that centenarians, people that are living over the age of 100, have a high amount of this circulating thing, this humanin. It is one of the strongest common denominators that we've seen with centenarians at a molecular level. This mitokine seems to be a heavy root of why they live longer. And it is secreted through mitochondrial stress and through exercise, which is mitochondrial stress. Now, how can we gamify this for us to live longer and for us to live more vibrant lives? It comes back down to that reverse J curve. And most of the evidence is now suggesting that a baseline of low intensity exercise every day is the foundation with periodic spurts of high intensity exercise. Just like eating at a baseline, somewhat low level, maybe moderate caloric restriction most of the time is good, but then occasionally aggressively restricting via some fasting is good for longevity. Because if you were to fast every day, you'd be inflicting a lot of stress on the body. If you were to do a CrossFit Metcon every day, you'd be inflicting a lot of stress upon the body. And unfortunately, I don't think there is enough fuel in the world to adequately repair all the oxidative damage that you've done via intense exercise constantly. So what you need to do is stop thinking of exercise as sort of a, I'm gonna exercise three days a week kind of thing, and think of your new baseline as, I don't know, a low level of exercise every day. Establish that as a baseline. Maybe for you it's a 10 minute walk, maybe it's a 30 minute walk, maybe it's a 60 minute walk, maybe it's a bike ride, but some form of lower intensity zone one or two every day. And then aggressive periodic sprints of short term intense exercise three days per week. And those are shorter exercises, right? Those are gonna be things like 15 minutes, 20 minutes, because different levels of stress are gonna do different things. Now, this leads me to stacking hormetic stressors. Okay, if one bit of stress is good, then a lot of stress is even better, right? Wrong, right? So one of the reasons I like to do fasted workouts is not because I'm compounding hormetic stressors. The reason I like to do fasted workouts is because I can get by, by doing more or doing less and getting more, right? So what I mean is, if I come in and I do a fasted workout, the level of hormetic stress is arguably higher because I'm working out, which is a hormetic stress, mitochondrial stressor, mitohormesis, and I'm fasting, which is mitohormesis. My level of energy, my energy deficit is greater, right? I have flipped that switch all the way down, which means I need less of it for the metabolic effect. So for my anti-aging sort of exercise, yeah, I have relatively short fasted workouts. And then if I wanna do longer workouts, I'll fuel. Like, because the benefit of exercise does not just come only if you're fasted. It just allows you to get it a little faster. So on the days that you're doing your lower intensity exercise, it might make sense from a longevity perspective to do it in a fasted state. And on the days that you're doing your higher intensity exercise for a different benefit, hypoxia, like oxygen deprivation, it makes sense to maybe have some fuel in your system. Because if you stack those stressors too much and you're not ready for it, that's a lot of damage that you could be doing. And one very important thing that I'll leave you with, don't ever by any means try to add copious amounts of antioxidants after your hard workouts. It will blunt the benefits. Uh, there was a study published in Journal Physiology that demonstrated this. When vitamins C or E were added right after a workout, it blunted the mitochondrial biogenesis that occurred from the workout. Not to say antioxidants are bad, but do not be supplementing antioxidants after intense exercise. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.